Hello and welcome to this video. Today I'd like to give you an introduction into custom kernels on Android devices and a quick overview of what you can tweak and modify in order to get your best settings. First of all, I assume that you are already rooted and know how to flash custom kernels. If that's not the case, please use Google or look at some links in the description of this video which will provide the necessary information. If you don't know what a kernel is, it is the bridge between hardware and software. It tells the software how to interact with the hardware. Without a kernel, no device would even work. Stock kernels don't give you much options. They simply work. Mostly they just try to give you performance without any big battery optimizations. Its main goal is a smooth device which does not limit the hardware capabilities in any way. As an average user, you can't do anything wrong with it. Your super flagship device is fast and smooth like you wanted it to be. Even if you're willing to sacrifice performance, you can't change much on stock kernels. I believe because beginners could mess up settings to get good battery life and complain about the flagship device being super slow and then send it back to the manufacturer because they're unsatisfied even though it's their own fault as they've messed everything up. Moreover, Two days of usage sounds great, but if you have a super quad-core smartphone which never uses all four cores in order to achieve good battery life, you feel ripped off. So it's better for manufacturers to keep an eye on performance than battery life. Luckily, there are custom kernels which will give you more control over your kernel. There are two types, CIF, Code Aurora Repository, and AOSP, Android Open Source Project. CAF is based on Qualcomm source code, which is a hardware manufacturer you might have heard of. Almost all non-Nexus devices are running a CAF kernel. Google's AOSP kernel is often based on CAF at the beginning and then modified for the Android version or Nexus devices. You can say CAF features better performance and optimizations, while AOSP has the newest and latest patches from the latest Android version. Good kernels try to get the best of both and merge certain patches from CAF and AOSP to get the best experience possible. Now we got the most important information. Let's talk about getting a freaking custom kernel. Firstly, you have to choose the right kernel. Very often, especially for Nexus devices, there are a lot of custom kernels out there that you can use. Not everyone is capable of everything. I'd say that there are three types. Personalized ones, which a developer has developed for himself, but shared with the community, close to stock and highly customizable ones. Which one to use comes down to your preference. Read what this particular kernel is all about and then decide. Furthermore, not every kernel is compatible with every ROM. When there's a boot IMG file inside a flashable zip, it might not be compatible with the ROM's RAM disk. This means that your device will not completely boot, but get stuck at the boot logo right before displaying the lock screen. This is why there's any kernel. Any kernel takes the original kernel's RAM disk and needed files, extracts or modifies it and then merges it with the custom kernel. So all needed files for the custom kernel to work are taken from the original stock kernel of the ROM which should work all the time. This makes a kernel compatible with almost every Android version and ROM. That's the reason why custom kernels should only be flashed after dirty flashing a system to prevent bugs by using files from custom kernel A and custom kernel B. Mostly a kernel will try to balance performance and battery life. It is impossible to increase battery life without decreasing performance, otherwise it would be implemented right away. There are a few which will sacrifice performance for battery life and vice versa. Again, normally a kernel is balanced and can be tweaked to focus on battery life or performance by the user. Performance should be limited to a certain level which will not make you notice any lags, performance issues or FPS drops to get the best battery life without feeling like having a $50 phone in your hand. Let's move on to the CPU clock. There's the minimum and maximum CPU clock. By increasing the minimum clock, your device will always be very fast, but will also drain more battery while the CPU isn't used at all. Even when idling, it will act like it's on the heavy load, so keeping this at stock is recommended. If possible, even use the lowest possible clock speed, as a lower clock will also run at a low voltage, which gives you huge battery savings, as the lowest clock speed might be on number one of all used clocks, besides the boost clock, which I'll exp explain later, and the max clock speed. By increasing the maximum CPU clock, which cannot be done on every kernel, the CPU won't stay as long on the max frequency as before, but will also drain more battery in a short period of time.
As mobile devices are very difficult to cool, I'd recommend not overclocking the CPU and to stay at stock clocks. Especially if you're not very into this topic, you might overheat or damage your device permanently as opposed to underclocking, which doesn't pose a threat to the hardware. On PCs, it's a different story, as fans and water coolers can easily handle the CPU's temperature when overclocked. To summarize, set the minimum frequency as low as possible and keep the maximum frequency at stock. Now to the governor. The governor decides when a CPU core should be clocked at a higher frequency. When doing nothing, it should be at the lowest frequency. But if you're using your device, it needs a higher clock to process data. In theory, the clock should only be as high as needed and not higher, which results in a higher battery drain, or lower, which results in a slower performance. The most important ones are Interactive, which is used very often as it's a very balanced governor, which clocks very high in a short time, but also goes back fast. Then there's conservative, which will not clock very high unless there's a high CPU load for a longer period of time. And power safe or performance, which will either stay at the minimum clock or stay at the maximum clock almost all the time. Very often interactive or conservative is the best option. But be aware that each kernel can tweak its governors so interactive on kernel A doesn't have to be the same as on kernel B. Moreover, some kernels feature their own governors with special names like interactive X or something like that. Now to CPU voltage. In order to save a few percentages of your precious battery and to decrease heat output, you can underclock your CPU. How low you can go depends on the device and the CPU binning. To sum up binning, you have to imagine that not every CPU is the same. Some are of higher quality and some of lower. In desktop CPUs, some might be low end and the others might be professional ones, even when they share no differences in production. However, in mobile devices, you'll never know what you get. Higher CPU binning values will allow you to undervolt more without becoming unstable. When undervolting your CPU, the worst thing that can happen is a reboot, which will happen as the CPU crashes as it doesn't get enough power. The worst thing that should happen is that you lose some of your recent data, like data not stored in your flash storage, but still in RAM. For example, a note that you did not save yet, but it will not harm your hardware. Doing the opposite, called overvolting, might decrease the lifespan of your CPU and make it get a lot hotter than it's intended to be. Overvolting is often required for overclocking to give the CPU enough power. However, overvolting should be avoided if you're not familiar with this. To find your CPU binning, type dmesg space vertical line space grep space pvs in the terminal. I'll post the command in the description. The higher the number is, the lower voltages your CPU can run at. Normally, people undervolt from 25 millivolts up to 100 millivolts. You should try lowering the voltage by 5 millivolts and use a CPU benchmark app or use your device for a couple of hours. If it reboots, try increasing the value. If not, decrease it until you hit that critical value and use a voltage which is 5 millivolts higher than a not working one. You could do this for every frequency, but I would just change the global voltage so that every clock speed is undervolted with the same value. This makes things a lot easier, trust me. Please note, never ever set voltage settings to apply and boot without using your device at least a few hours. Otherwise, your device might crash and boot up because of the low voltage and without getting to the kernel app to modify this, you will have to manually delete the, se the settings or reflash everything. Please be aware of that. Now to hot plugging. On a multi-core device, keeping every core online, even when not needed, drains the battery as hell. So hot plugging allows to disable a core when not used, enable it or plug it in when needed. It is somehow like the CPU clocks, but with cores. In theory, it would be perfect if, for example, a second core only comes online when the first core is on the max load and cannot give you more performance. The second core should be disabled again when the first core can handle the load alone. As the system has to think a short period of time if it needs more cores, slight lags can appear when having very few cores online all the time. To save some battery life, you can make a quad-core system dual-core all the time, so two cores will never be plugged in and used. For performance, you can enable all four cores and never unplug any of them. When disabling the hot plugging drive completely on your multi-core device, it will run as a single core, which is often as bad as setting the max clock to the lowest frequency. I'll explain why later. 
For hot plugging, there are a lot of drivers like MP Decision, IntelliPlug, Zen Decision, and Mako, developed by Francisco Franco. Each has its own settings and can be tweaked with a compatible kernel app. Where often you will see a slider called Load Threshold, which controls when a new core should be plugged in, for example at 80% load, and if lower as 20%, the new core should be disabled again. Sometimes you can even only allow a certain number of cores to stay active while in standby. Also, there's a CPU boost or touch boost. This will automatically increase the CPU clock when you touch the screen of your device, so the CPU has enough power to provide a smooth experience when you interact with it, and not only staring at the screen. A higher CPU boost clock will provide a smooth experience. A lower one might save some battery, but you might notice performance drops when scrolling or zooming. You can also tweak the milliseconds it needs to clock the CPU higher and even how long it will wait after you stop touching your screen before going to the lowest clock speed. You can experiment with these settings, but stock ones are often the best. Next up is I.O. This handles the in and output of the RAM or storage. It should prioritize important tasks or apps and give them enough resources to work fast and efficient. While a balanced I.O. scheduler like CFQ, which gives every process the same resources, looks good and might look very fair, it might give unimportant apps resources which others desperately need. Another famous one is Deadline, which is almost a real-time scheduler. For noobs, this means it's very good. But when there's too much data, some processes might get lost as the limit is reached. The most recommended one is called FIOPS and is intended for flash storage, which every smartphone has. Moreover, there is the read ahead size, which varies from device to device. Normally, a higher size like 2048 kilobytes is very good to give SD cards and other storage devices a bit of cash to give better performance. Sometimes you'll also have create C states. These are the states which a CPU can go to. C0 means instant wake up. The higher the number is, the deeper the sleep is. There's also C1, C2 and C3. People say that only disabling C2 will save some battery, but I would keep all enabled. On advanced kernels, you might even be able to change the dirty background ratio or dirty ratio or even swappiness and VFS cache pressure. These settings determine when data will be moved from RAM to a cache or swap disk or even written to the device's storage. The more free RAM your device has, the more can be stored in order to prevent the system from writing data from RAM to the swap disk every minute. However, it will store more data in RAM when possible, which not every device is capable of, especially when only having a low amount. These settings are very advanced and can also be left at stock. Now to the GPU. Recent devices only have one GPU core, so hot plugging is not a huge topic there. If you're never gaming or using a video editor app, you can try setting its max frequency to a low setting to save battery. Keeping the minimum frequency as low as possible is also recommended. I would not really change the GPU governor, but of course you can also experiment a bit with this setting. Keep in mind that for example the power safe governor will lock your GPU to the lowest clock speed, which can result in a low FPS while gaming. I would always change the governor when gaming and change it back when normal using your device. This needs some effort but can improve your battery life. Finally, there is also the TCP congestion control. It doesn't have any impact on battery life. The most recommended ones are Restwood, Reno and Cubic, while I would definitely use Restwood as it gives you the best download upload performance and the lowest latency. Having a bad algorithm can result in a slower download and upload speed and a higher latency. The algorithm tries to fully use the network capabilities without needing to send data twice as data got lost or not transferred for example because the algorithm is sending more data than the network is capable of. Last but not least you have features like thermal control or temperature throttle in order to set the heat limit for the CPU. When this limit is reached, your CPU will automatically use lower clock speeds to prevent overheating. This can be set to any temperature you prefer, but shouldn't be too low or too high as you would get slow performance all the time as the temperature is reached or too high temperatures which could harm your device. Moreover, you can tweak the colors of your screen to get the colder display of the iPhone or perfect 6500K temperature with natural colors. Some kernels even give you the ability to block certain kernel wake locks, which keep the device awake, but are almost completely useless. There might even be some more features, 
but that depends on the kernel. Don't forget that not every kernel has every mentioned feature. I just tried to explain as much options as I could to give you a quick overview of what you can tweak and what a certain option will change. In the end, I would advise you to keep things balanced. Locking the CPU to the lowest clock might make the CPU drain almost no battery at all, but at the same time it will drain the battery longer as it needs more time. Not even the CPU might take longer, but the screen will also be active for a longer period of time. Think of this, when opening an app, the CPU might consume a lot of power for a second, but then you can use the app, finish the task and put your device into standby. If it's locked to a very low clock, it might take 15 seconds to open the app and even longer to finish the task. Moreover, the longer it takes for a task to finish, the longer the screen will stay active. You've might prevented the CPU from draining your battery, but the screen was activated for a longer time, which drained as much or even more battery than it would have when the CPU did its job with more power. Please be aware that you need a good kernel manager app in order to change all of these settings. I can recommend Synapse, Kernel Editor, Franco Kernel App or Full Kernel Manager. Also, X Kernel Manager is a good choice. Each has its own settings and not everyone might be compatible with your kernel. Just check on the kernel's page to get the recommended kernel manager app or try different apps. Please note that you shouldn't use two kernel manager apps at the same time with apply and boot options activated for the same options. This could result in weird settings as both apps will try to change the same option on boot up. So when using multiple kernel manager apps, know which settings are applied on which app. I really hope I could give you an overview of what a kernel is all about and how you can modify it for your own needs. There is no perfect kernel and there are no perfect settings out there. For a good battery life you have to decide for yourself how much of performance you want to give up without getting annoyed. I would play around a bit and even use Google to get a good starting point for a device kernel combination. Please be warned, I'm not responsible for anything you do to your device. This video is only intended to give you some basic information on custom kernels and its settings. For more information, please use Google or XDA developers. Of course, you can also ask questions in the comments below. So, like this video if you liked it, dislike it if you had no idea what I'm talking about, or leave a comment if you have anything to share or ask. Please subscribe if you like my videos, as every subscription really makes my day. Thanks for watching.